Good luck. Thanks, Poppy. Thank Thanks to all of you. I've, I, I can't say I've ever been surrounded by as many conservationists. So it's, it's really an honor to be here and to be with, invited to present at the WCN. So macaws are some of the most recognizable of all parrots. They're known to have, to, to pair for life. And although that's not actually true, I can tell you that from first-hand experience, they do make very strong pair bonds. As a young lad growing up in North Yorkshire, I had many parrots. And one of those parrots was Wilbury, a, a macaw. And she and I spent a lot of time together. And we would eat together. We would preen each other from time to time. And when I would ride my bicycle, she would sit on the handlebars. She loved the sense of speed that she got from racing down these country lanes. And I would get these wafts of macaw as the wind ruffled her feathers. They have a really unique smell. Well, Wilby was very protective of me, and she was somewhat jealous of my girlfriend at the time, and that was a little bit problematic. <laughs> if, if I interacted with my girlfriend and Wilbury saw, she would just scream the house down. And I learned a lot from Wilbury. So when I, now when I see birds in the wild, like Mick and Cece here, I, I often think back to Wilbury and all the things that I learned from her. And that's, that's really special for me. And, uh, and it's, it's great to, to have that connection, to know that all these birds are individuals. Now, although macaws are very recognizable, the great green macaw is not so well known. You're probably much more familiar with showy species, like the scarlet macaw. Now, I'm going to set the tone early here, and I'm going to say, for me, the scarlet macaw is like an American corvette, a red, loud corvette that screams, look at me. <laughs> the great green macaw is more subtle. It's more sophisticated. <laughs> it only reveals its beautiful colors when it flies. It's like a classy British Aston Martin. <laughs> now, imagine for a moment that you're this macaw, and you're flying over the rainforest. This is what you see. Wouldn't that be amazing? It's the kind of thing little penguins dream about. <laughs> Sadly, the great green macaw is missing from this forest. It's no longer found there. It's a, it's a terrible shame, and it's something we want to do something about. The reason they're not found there is partly because of the threats they face, but also because of their behavior. Now, Mick and Cece are adorable goofballs, and it's sometimes hard to believe that they're so intelligent. But parrots are really intelligent. Just, just two weeks ago, there was a story about a parrot that made an order using Alexa from Amazon.com. Somebody's <laughs> nodding. She's seen it. I've not even done that. <laughs> parrots use tools, and that's something that the great apes do. So parrots are incredibly intelligent. Now, when Mick and Cece had a, a chick, that chick was dependent on them for six months. And they, the family stayed together until the next breeding season. During that time, and into the chick's adolescence, it's learning from its family and also from its social network. And the way that they do this is very similar to ourselves. I'm here with uh, my wife, Sarah, who's working on the project. And we added a few days onto our travels so that we could enjoy the city and, and see some of California. We emailed the WCN team. Sophie was wonderful, and she gave us some recommendations. And we, went, we traveled down to Monterey. We saw whales, and we had so much good food. Now, one evening, we just walked into town, and we went to a restaurant. We, we found the, the restaurant we had in mind, but it was empty. 
Across the road, there was another restaurant, and there was cars parked in front. Somewhere deep in our psyche, that told us that the foraging was good, and we wouldn't be eaten by a predator. <laughs> so, of course, we went to that restaurant. Now, these examples are familiar to you, I'm, I'm sure. And you may have even used those, these kinds of things to work out how to get here today, or which presentations to attend. When we lose macaws from a rainforest, that knowledge is lost. And so it's very hard to put parrots back. And that's a challenge that we face. We're only really beginning to understand the importance of the parrots' intelligence and their social systems. Now, this, this might sound a little bit grand, but I believe that, that every bit is important for the parrots as it is for chimpanzees and other great apes, for the dolphins, and even elephants. Birds are everywhere, and they're very visible. You've probably seen some birds in the last few days, maybe even a, a parrot from Telegraph Hill. The great green macaw is, is a big bird, and it's iconic. So it makes an excellent flagship for the rainforest. And birds are often the portal through which people are first exposed to conservation. Now, when we protect Mick and Cece, we're protecting an amazing diversity of wildlife. Costa Rica has 250 mammals. There are 900 different bird species. There are 400 different reptiles and amphibians. There's a quarter of a million insects. But don't worry, I'm only going to show you this one. <laughs> the rainforest is an amazing ecosystem, and many of these species are found in the ecosystem. Sadly, though, of course, there's been one or two changes over the years. Now, I often find that habitat loss is a difficult thing to grasp. It's, it's a term that's so familiar, and yet it's untangible. So I wanted to come up with a, a way to illustrate this today that would make sense to all of you here. So this is the Bay Area, and we're going to do some, do some damage. Now, I realize, of course, there's been some, uh, some terrible fires in California, and I don't mean to be insensitive. This is a lighthearted uh, demonstration of what's happened for the macaws. So first, we're going to convert 14% of that forest into agriculture, intensive crops like banana and pineapple. No animal can live in these, these areas. In the 1950s, America's fast food industry was growing very rapidly, and the land was converted, forest was replaced for pasture. Nearly half of the rainforest was cut down in just a matter of decades. Is anybody affected, anybody from an affected area yet? Yeah? I'm afraid you're going to have to move. <laughs> when a forest is cut, primary forest is cut down, but stuff regrows, we call that secondary forest. Secondary forest, for macaws, is kind of like an office. It's, it's okay to spend time there, but it's, it just doesn't work. It's not the place you're going to raise a family. 16% of the land has been converted to secondary forest. Now, we're going to take a little detour. This is a mountain almond tree. They're incredible giants of the forest. And in pristine habitat, they dominate the rainforest. They're enormous trees, and you can hide behind the buttress roots. In fact, this is a human. The macaws feed on the nuts of this tree, and 90% of known macaw nests in Costa Rica are also in this tree. But unfortunately, there's been a lot of change for the mountain almond tree. Now, this is where I want to get you involved. I'd like your help to demonstrate what's happened. Now, remember, you've all hopefully been, uh, received a sticker on your way in. Some of those were scarlet macaws, and some of those were great green macaws. Take, take a look and make sure you know which one you have. And then, if everybody could put their hand up. We'll give you a second. Great. OK, I see a beautiful forest of mountain almond trees. OK? Now, those of you with the scarlet macaw sticker, hang on, I've got this here. Okay. The scarlet macaw sticker is the white, 
Oh, no, not necessarily. But the, the red parrot and the great green. If you have a scarlet macaw, keep your hand up. If you've got a great green, put your hand down. Thank you. Take a look around. Nine out of ten mountain almond trees have been cut down. Thank you. I'll put those down. So the impact is devastating for the macaws, as you can imagine. Let's go back to the map. We've now chopped down 90% of your remaining buildings. Sorry. You'll see that there's remaining areas of forest, and they're, they're fragmented. There's tiny little patches down. No, that's the, there. There's tiny little patches. It's, my laser's not working so great. There we go. This, this is representative of what's happened for the macaw. Their habitat is fragmented. So now you can see, I hope, how habitat loss has been devastating for the macaw. But there's a strange thing. Even now, there's habitat where there are no macaws. How is that even possible? It's possible because we humans have been stealing their babies. These are vastly intelligent and social species. And people take them as pets, and they live in isolation. This is Pepper. Pepper was found in Nicaragua. I, was gonna, I wasn't going to break up. Yeah, Pepper was, this is, this is so soft. Pepper was uh, found in Nicaragua, and she was living in terrible conditions. Sadly, not unique conditions. Many macaw chicks are taken from their families. Parrots, poaching of parrots, the collection of parrot chicks, remains a problem, particularly in Honduras and Nicaragua. We, this is something we, we can change. And luckily for Pepper, she was rescued and she's now living, uh, she's in good hands. So, if we estimate the, the population of macaws before things, things got bad, we can, we can confidently say from extrapolating available data that there were hundreds of thousands of macaws. Maybe, maybe even a million, but hundreds of thousands. Today, there's 1,500 macaws left. There are 1,200 people at the expo. That's nearly the entire great green macaw population. So the trend is clear. The great green macaw, if no action is taken, the great green macaw is going extinct. It's clear. So how do we go from a situation where we have empty forests like this one to one where the macaws are thriving? That's something that we're, that's our vision. That's what we want to see. We want thriving populations of parrots. You might ask, is it even possible? Well, I can confidently say that it is. My first experiences in conservation were at age 16. I was very, very fortunate. And I got out to the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. There I worked with the echo parakeet. And at that time, there was a global population of eight individuals. There are now more than 700. And that's as a result of a tremendous effort of fantastic people and hands-on techniques. So it is possible. For the great green macaw, we need to restore their populations. We need to prevent further loss, eliminate threats. And we do that first and foremost by working with the community. We want to change behaviors. We want people to no longer cut down trees. We want people to stop collecting baby parrots. This is Tirsa. Tirsa uh, is just amazing to watch. And I was delighted to have the opportunity to see her at work at the Great Green Macaw Festival, which is an annual event that we're involved in. Tirsa was determined that everybody who attended one of her workshops would leave feeling more inspired about macaws and their conservation. It was awesome for me to, to see her at work because she got started and then lunchtime just came and passed. And, and I realized the best way I could help her was just to keep feeding her and then giving her drinks so she could just power on. 
And she was really amazing. And that, that's a new thing for me. I mean, I'm an ecologist. I like birds. And, and here I am working with people. <laughs> but of course, it's awesome to work with such an amazing team of people. And in my role as director, I get to support my team and see them work their butts off at, um, at the stuff that they're really passionate about. And collectively, we, of course, can achieve so much more. Another component of our work, our outreach work, is to work with local artists from our village. And this is work that Sarah has developed. The local artists were do, dabbling in this, this work, and Sarah's helped really help them develop their work, their products, and we sell that to tourists. Anna, a young lady who's a, an amazing artist, is in the audience today. She's working with the, uh, with the artists to improve their work. And now, the local ladies and one guy who's very good, um, they are earning up to $1,000 a month from this work, which we're really proud of. I don't often get the chance to acknowledge my team in public, so I'd like us to give a round of applause to Sarah and Anna for their work. <laughs> if you'd like to hear more, about our community work, or uh, to, sit, to buy some of this amazing art, which will support the local ladies, then please visit our table shortly, well, after, our, after the penguins. <laughs> There's another component of outreach work which I've done on the Caribbean island of Bonaire. I studied the yellow-shouldered Amazon parrot for my PhD, and after that, I founded a nonprofit, and the first thing we did was we tackled trade. We facilitated law enforcement. The parrot was protected, but the police didn't want to enforce the law because they didn't want to be stuck with a bunch of parrots. We simply took those parrots off their hands and cared for them and rehabilitated them. That achieved a massive shift in community behavior. And that, of course, has to be paired with a longer-term approach where we inspire people to care about parrots and to love the parrots. But in the short term, it had tremendous results. We tripled, we didn't triple, they, the parrots, working on their own, their population tripled in 15 years once they were freed of that problem. These are techniques that we would like to apply to Great Green Macaws. We're very fortunate in Costa Rica that the community, as I'm sure you're aware, is very progressive. They're very nature, they're very into their nature conservation. And that's great for us because it means our outreach work is well received and it gives us the freedom to do more than just uh, stop the decline. We're, we're able to work with the birds directly and restore populations. This is a great green macaw nest. And as you can see, the, the nests, big trees with big holes in them are not in great shape. And one of the things we can do is do some home repairs for the parrots. And from, with materials of only $100, we can make profound changes, which makes nests usable where they weren't before. This, is, this allows us to simply give every pair the chance to breed, and then we are gonna, we'll go on to monitor the population and then we can make sure that every chick survives and that those chicks go on to join the population. We're boosting productivity. Another way that we can boost productivity is through reintroduction. These birds are at our re reintroduction site on the Caribbean coast. We've, the Arrow Project has reintroduced 47 birds. And this is a way of artificially adding birds to the population. But it means that we can recolonize areas where the parrots have gone extinct. The great green macaws come from our breeding center. We put birds together and we let the magic happen.
veux et je viens. Our captive birds this year were many of them were new pairs, but they when our expectations were actually quite low, but they had seven babies. So we're really proud of our our birds. Now, these seven babies, we want to reintroduce them back into the wild. Remember that forest at the beginning, the scene where you were flying? Yeah, you weren't really flying. Um, we want to see those birds flying over that forest. That would be my dream. Another part of the dream is that you will come and see them flying over the forest. When we reintroduce those birds, we need to teach them what foods are. Wild chicks get an education from their parents, but our reintrodu reintroduced birds don't get that. So we need to help them, because it might not be immediately obvious like, that something like this is a food. This comes back to that, that social stuff of building up the population, so they've got the knowledge and they can find their way around. When we do that, we need to provide them with a safety net. And the way we do that is we train them to use feeders. Look at that way. So here we've got birds that are on one of our feeders. And this is simply a way of giving them security while they get to know the forest. So when they, they slowly learn where the mountain almond trees are, but this is their safety net. This is a nest barrel that we've put up in a tree to compensate for the loss of mountain almond trees. And our reintroduced birds love them. There's a parrot sticking his head out, enjoying the view. They're 100 feet up in the trees, so they're having a great time. And we're very fortunate that when we work with our reintroduced birds, they're familiar with man-made structures. So these barrels were well-received. Our release population produced nine chicks this year. Now, population of great green macaws in Costa Rica alone, at the last count, was 300 birds. Between our breeding center and our release site, our birds have added 5% to that number this year. And we're only getting started. So this is where we can really, we can, we're not just stopping the decline, we're putting birds back. And that's really very, very satisfying. So the ARA project is changing behaviors through outreach. Sorry. We're boosting productivity through working with wild birds. We're restoring populations through reintroductions. And we're doing a little bit of habitat work, and we're going to be doing a lot more in the future. You can expect to see more. These things are great, but working in Costa Rica alone is not enough. The great green macaw is found from Honduras in the north, all the way down to Ecuador in the south, six countries. We need to scale up our work so that we're restoring populations across this range. In the long term, we need to rewild the birds, rewild habitat corridors, so that we connect populations together again. To do that, we need to scale up our efforts. We are, we're working to develop best practices and to share those techniques with a macaw conservation network. We want to be developing our partnerships with our, with our colleagues in other countries and making sure that best practices are applied and that the populations across the range are coming back. Your support can make that happen. I personally cannot wait to see the macaws thriving again, flying over the forest where they once existed. I don't plan to stop until we get there, and I hope that you will join me on that journey. Thank you.